Ladies and gents, we back from halftime. We promise you guys a sp special, special guest joining us on the opposite side of the half. We went out and made a big time addition. You guys know how we do. Usually we add members to the secondary. We even added some members to the quarterback position. But we went out and got a prime, or prime time electric fine wide receiver, a good friend of mine, uh, also a foe at one point in time on the collegiate level, first round pick in 2001 out of the University of Miami. I will not say out of the, I won't <laughs> say that letter. I won't say the letter, but I will say the University of Miami, 14 year NFL vet, 2005 Pro Bowler, second team all pro that same year. You can find them on Instagram at eight to the nine on Instagram, man. Santana Moss here, all things covered. Join us on the show, Pat P, Brian McFadden. Tanner, man, how you doing? What's up, man? I mean, I've been, I've been, you know, we're going to get off topic a little bit or a little early. Uh, I've been waiting for you to come back to Miami so we can boo, man. But, you know, we'll say. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Pat P, I forgot to tell I forgot to tell you, man. Tanner's heavy. He's heavy in the boo. Listen, man, I, I I seen it all, Mac. I seen all the boo. Man, man Tanner heavy in the boo, man. We got We got to get in some of our stories a little later in the show, Tanner, man. Because you know how we used to get it cracking in the boo down there in Miami. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no doubt. But, man, we got to address something just starting in the first quarter with, with you, man. Growing up, you're a South Florida kid, Carroll City, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? 305 Dade County. But you grew up rooting for the Hurricanes, the Seminoles, and the Gators. Why was it so hard How for you to root possible? for one team? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> How is that even possible? You rooted for all three in-state, big-time, blue blood football programs. Why was it so difficult for you to choose one to root for? I mean, it was only natural to root for the home team because I was from Miami. So you always going to root for Miami. My grandmother used to take me to the Miami games when I was young. And um, there was a guy she said that was something just like myself, a punt returner, wide receiver. I forgot the guy's name, but he was all world. And I never even grew up, you know, really. I was That was way before my time. I was too young to remember. Mm -hmm. But as I got older and then I became a chief, I mean, something about them Seminoles, you know, and it was just like, man, that chant we had. I went to a, I went to a Florida State Cincinnati Bearcats game. My grandmother took me to my cousin was playing in Cincinnati Bearcats. He was a he was a true freshman from out of New Orleans playing receiver. And I remember it like it was yesterday. And, you know, just being in the area, I'm like, man, I'm rooting for Florida State. But my cousin's a bear cat, so I got to show him some love. So I'm there rooting for my cousin, but I wanted Florida State to win. Uh, I bought my, I bought a jersey. She gave me, she gave me money to buy a jersey, and I bought the oddest number, 48. This 48 Florida State jersey, mm -hmm. bro. It's crazy how the world works, how things come back around to you. But I'm sitting there with this 48 jersey on. Family members mad at me. They don't, <laughs> I don't care. Man, I got a Florida State jersey on. And then fast forward, that was my number at Miami. Ain't yeah, that your freshman year. Your, your freshman year, right? So That's crazy. Yeah, I'm the win 48. And I'm sitting here like, man, maybe I'm getting paid back from winning that 40, buying that 48. <laughs> I went to watch my cousin. But I don't know, brother. I really don't, man. It's just, I was, a, um, I think it was always Florida State for me. You know, in the state of Florida, when you had to put all teams together, it was just Florida State. It was something about them more than it was Miami, but I still couldn't just leave my team behind, so I rooted for them also. Yeah, but wait a minute, wait a minute. So, so growing up, hey Pat, P, you know I, you know I got to dig a little deeper into this I you, topic. I you like to dig, man. Tana, you man. Dig. Growing up, you had a, a diehard love for Florida State. Florida State, but you go to Miami. <laughs> yeah, like what, what 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 created the disconnect? I mean, you you tell me. I want to know my leave home, man. man. I mean, honestly, you, you, think about it, man. you just look, you know how it is, man. Um, Florida State was one of those hit schools. Miami was too. But at the time when Miami got me in the doors, they wasn't. They was on a kind of mm -hmm. like decline and they was losing scholarships crazy and on probation, you name it. It was so much going on in Miami. So now you have a, a thirst for whatever talent you can get. I mean, however you can get them in the doors, they was doing that in Miami. At Florida State, I remember. Uh, I forgot y'all defensive back coach. I think he was a defensive uh, coordinator. Mick, Mickey Andrews. Andrews would come down. He was watching Bradley. And I'm yep. sitting there trying my hardest to go show this dude what I could do in practice. I mean, I'm, I see him on the sideline. I'm I'm bumming cats <laughs> in practice. 
Kara City wasn't throwing the ball like that. And right. when you look at the body of work that I had up until that point when he was looking at Bradley and some of the other guys we had, OJ, you know, OJ yeah. played D-line at the time. He's watching all those guys on defense. But it, it was nothing that I did that can kind of like raise his eyebrows. And it was all cool. It was cool because I understood my circumstances. You know, it was just, you know, odd for us to even, you know, show off or have a guy outside that can really, you know, show the stuff in that kind of offense we was in. But uh, so if, it, if Florida State would have offered Tanner, you would have went to Tallahassee? Oh, for no, no question. Yeah. No question. <laughs> oh, man. Because I knew Florida State would have offered me to, to come in there and play football. No like question. I said right. before, I don't even, you know, coming into Miami, I turned to, I, you know, when I first got um, notice of how I was getting in the door, it wasn't like the football team really wanted me. It was track. So yeah. I was like, no, I'm not coming. And it wasn't until I took a visit to Western Michigan and experienced the cold. And I was like, oh, shit. If Miami give me that track scholarship, then I'm taking it because, you know, I can play football. I wasn't I didn't have no doubt in my mind. And think about it. All the guys that came from Kerosene that went to Florida State and Miami. Miami was getting D. Brown, you know, our, our safety, Devin Brown. And they also mm-hmm. wanted uh, Robert uh, Sanford, our running back. Um, surprisingly, he didn't go there. He ended up going to Western Michigan. Yeah. And they took they took Najee Davenport instead of him. Both of those guys mm-hmm. was head to head when it comes to best running backs, you know, in high school football that year. So I knew I could play with these guys. I'm lining up next to these guys every day. So mm-hmm. there's no question that if you're picking these guys to go anywhere around Florida or wherever else, I can play on the collegiate level at a high level. So I just wanted to get in the door. So once I realized that that opportunity was through track, I'm like, hey, you ain't got to tell me again. I'm going to get in here and then the rest is going to be up to me. Yeah. And Chen, I was going to ask you about, the, uh, you know, how a guy like yourself become a walk on, but you just uh, alluded to that very well, but I'm going to jump to my my next question. When you, you get to Miami at the time, you guys, like you talked about, you guys wasn't quite at the level you guys were in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. What groundwork or what uh, what groundwork that you guys put in motion to to that 2000, you know, the early 2000s to turn that thing back around? Um, Great question. Uh, honestly, man, my class was like no other. That that 2001 class, graduating class, we came in in 97 and we was all just eager to be. We grew up watching Miami like you got to think about it. I saw it firsthand. I'm sitting right there in the backyard watching these Hurricanes be dominant, you know. Right. So everybody else who they kind of went out to recruit, Reggie Wayne, Darrell Jones, uh, you name it. All the other guys, uh, um, Dan Morgan, um, all these guys who came in my class. You know, Ed Reed, we actually got a chance to see what Miami was like. And we wanted to be, be a part of that. We didn't mm-hmm. care about what they was going through. I'm like, look, in order for us to be known around here, we have to be a part of what these guys did by putting these plaques up, putting those trophies on the stand and raising those banners in our stadium and stuff like that. So we was eager to make a difference. And then we also understood that we on probation right now. We have a prime time to really go out here and really strut our stuff and be noticed early because they need players. Like my freshman year, I think it was the most freshman that ever had played in Miami history. We had to play walk-ons. Yeah, mm-hmm. staff, I was a walk. I was considered a walk-on. Like we had, it was guys other than me though who wasn't getting a scholarship that was playing as a walk-on. So it was just odd, man. But we went through so much that 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 first year. Guys before us, they had a class before us with EJ. Uh, Nate Webster, you name it. It was Nate. It was EJ, Nate Webster, Al Blades, uh, Damian Lewis. That Leonard class, Myers. Leonard Myers was, was on that team. Yeah, yeah, that class. Leonard Myers came in with me. That yeah. class alone had already set the tone as that. Hey, man, we got to make a difference around here. So the 2001 class is joint, joint forces, and like, look, we want to be a part of history, but not the history that's going on right now. A part of some of the history that was left behind. In order for us to do that, we got to come out and be special. So that's what happened, man. We really made a pack then as freshmen, like, look, before we leave here, we're going to win the national championship. That was our pack. So what was your emotions then missing out on that epic season, seeing someone like Eric Reed who ended, mm-hmm. who ended college with you being a part of that team? Like, what was your emotions seeing those guys win the championship when you uh, went on to the league? I wasn't mad. I was more mad with the, with the college football itself because I feel like they let us down, you know. Don't get me wrong. Look here, however you want to call it, we got a chance to finally beat Florida State my senior year. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, at the end of the day, regardless of who was better or not, it is what it is. If you you set the rules and say that 
You have to beat the best to be the best. We mm -hmm. did that. You know, we lost one game early in the season where we went out to Washington and laid down. And we could have easily won that game if they give me that touchdown at the end of the game. You can go back and watch the film. All you need is one foot in college football. I got one foot in the end zone. They say I was out of bounds. But we gave these guys a game because we allowed them to get ahead of us early and we fought our way back. So whatever it may be, we put ourselves in that situation. But then we beat the best. Florida right. State, that was the best. We beat them. So fair and square, we should, we should be honored or given that right to play in a national championship game. We wasn't. Hey, hey Tanner, real quick. So do you feel like the refs was against Miami at the time in the, in the early 2000s? Because you remember in 2001, that P.I. call, which was <laughs> not a P.I. Yeah, and, so you know, I, 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 I was a huge U.M. fan uh, as well. So do you think the refs had a little bit to do with, you know, with the with, with the game at the time? Or you think they felt a certain way about you? You know what? I can sit here and be that bitter player and say, yeah, it was always against us and so a little of that still lingers in my head, thinking that people didn't want to see it, see the dominance again. I, I I do believe that. Right. But some of that stuff was hard to you know um you know not you know not see because we were just dominant. We was a dominant force. If you think about it, if we allowed to go to the 2000 national championship, not saying that we just going to beat Oklahoma. We don't know. We didn't get the chance to play them. I felt we would though. That team was we was one of those teams. We easily right. beat that game. Not saying we will, but I'm saying if we beat that game, then they go win in 2001. Then 2002, they have another chance to win, which they won that game against Ohio State. That was, yep. you know, we're talking about that penalty. <laughs> we have another three-peat in Miami. You know what I'm saying? So it was a lot. You can, you, can, you can see now that we're talking about it. It was a lot going on back then to not allow us to be yep. who we were because people didn't want to see Miami that dominant again. They knew that that dominance brought a lot of cockiness and swag that they didn't like to see, and they didn't want to see college football go down that path again. And yeah. I, I know you I, you were I, not I a part of the – I know you weren't a part of the 2001 championship team, but you laid the foundation. Your class, as you stated, laid the foundation for that successful epic year. And you you played with all of those guys that were able to ho hoist that championship trophy. So the question for you, Tanner – do you believe that 2001 team championship Miami team is one of the best college championship teams to ever do it? If so, why? I mean, I'm all being biased. Yeah, I'm going to say they was the best team ever. You know what I mean? No, but, no, you can't. You can't be biased on here. You can't be biased with it. You, you got to be honest. You got to be, be honest. Real. I'm going to be real. I mean, I can't look beyond Miami. I don't care about other schools because that's where. You know, that's all, I, you know, orange and green. Like, yeah, at one point in time, it was other schools that I wanted to attend. Yeah. Once I got in those doors, it was nobody else that I ever thought about, you know. Um, but I truly believe that the 2001 team, especially because they won a national championship, they have to be, you know, when it comes to just the, just the athletes alone. And then it wasn't about just winning it. You know what I mean? It's the way they won it. You know what I mean? It's the, it's the scale of how you watch those games. Those games – you can arguably sit here right now. We can sit here and, and bring up a lot of cases of each guy that was a part of that championship. What did they do afterwards? You know what I'm saying? Guys that made, you know, uh, monumental, you know, uh, or, or you could say pivotal uh, points in that those those games leading up, leading up to the national championship and the national championship game. What was their post careers like after they left? So when you look at that alone, like I watch a lot of college football to still mm -hmm. to this day. And yes, you're going to get some of those teams that you're like, man, that team was put together, blah, blah, blah. But then when those guys leave, those guys who was so, you know, pivotal in the team winning, what did they do in their post careers? Did they was they you didn't see that that's that same play on the pro level. So that's how I grade. I look at those guys and what they did in college. And then I say, man, as pros, they was dominant, too. And they had long careers. So that's why, you know, I give that 2001 team a nod because. One, I don't look past UM. And then two is just looking at the, you know, they, their body of work after they left college. All those guys had great careers. Those guys who we talked about in college making those plays, they went to the pros and they was dominant, you know, on the pro level as well. Yeah. That's a that's a good way to look at it. You know yeah. what I mean? You can definitely take it from different angles, but that, that's a big time point, you know what I mean? What what the successful collegiate players did that won a championship, what did they do in the next level? Which is yeah, the, the reason why I bring that up though, or be Matt, because think about it. You can always argue and say, well, they played the way they played on, on the college level because the coaching, mm -hmm. you know, it's always system and coaching. Yep. And then you can say, man, that team was dominant because the players 
and then look what they did. You know what I mean? So that's how I look at it. Cause I've seen a lot of collegiate ball players that in college, I sit back and be like, man. And then you like, what happened to that guy when he, when he got drafted? Yeah. You yeah, know what no. I'm saying? So, and then that tells you right then and there where it was just the system, you know, cause I, I sit here and go back and forth with people all the time because folks fail to realize is that we get graded. I hate it because I'm a receiver, but I've always had a level head about judging receivers or judging myself. I, you, I can only be judged off what I'm allowed to do. You mm-hmm. understand? So if you put me in a system that's going to exploit what I do best, then yes, if I don't succeed, then judge me. You know what I'm saying? Cause the system was there. I had the quarterbacks. I had the offense. I had the attempts judge me, but you put me in a system where, it was it was mediocre, but I still flourished. I blossomed. Then you got to look at him and like, well, this guy was pretty special. If he had the things that other guys have, boy, what would happen? You know what I mean? What would have happened? So, you know, we get into those discussions a lot nowadays because they look at player stats and it bothers me so much. You be like, man, you see his stats? You see what he did? I'm going to applaud that guy. I tip my hat off to him because you had to go out there and do it. But don't look down on a guy because he didn't have the same stats. Look at the body of work. Look at what he did against the same competition. And that's how you got to judge these guys. Yeah. Yeah. No I doubt. Agree. I like yeah. that. I like that take. Yeah. But, but I, I, I won't agree with you, though. That, that oh, one team is not the best team. So I'm just throwing that out there. But I <laughs> well, like look, the take, though. Look, I don't agree either because I would say the 2000 team we didn't win a championship. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, I know that, why that. You ain't gonna go, you're not going to agree with me. I, you know, you similar to just have something about – those Kings, man, regardless of how much we try to put that that pass behind us and be boys, the only time I can be your boy is when we're playing cards. Because if we start talking about football, then we got to go at each other here. You know what I'm saying? So, hey, you, you already know. Anytime we played y'all, man, any anytime the field goal team ran on the football field, man, we holding our breath, man. Man, Pat P, I, man, listen. Even to this day, anytime I see Florida State trot on the football field to kick a field goal, man, I'm ready to throw up. Yeah. No, listen, Mac, I'll never forget. I remember playing for the Park Ball uh, Pompano Eagles, and it was always on a Saturday night. I remember the rainy game when uh, my boy Roscoe Paris got his inside. Oh, yeah, that was it. That was it. Oh, that Tanner was, was going then. That was, oh, that was, that was 03, right? 03. Yeah. yeah. That's my junior year. That was 03. Hey. That was yeah. Boosie. Boosie, Boosie hit him. him. Boosie hit him. Yeah. They had them orange pants on. That was like our yes, first sir. time rocking them orange pants. a hurricane pants. game. Like, yes, sir. Hey, but uh, yeah, I remember watching all those games um, uh, doing park ball, getting ready for my game. But Tanner, man, we heading to draft this week, which is mind boggling, boggling to me. I didn't even know you was in the same draft class as Reggie Wayne. Yeah. Well, heading to, into draft night, did you think you or Reggie Wayne would be the first receiver, first Miami receiver selected? Great question, man. Honestly, look. <laughs> Because I get, you know, especially that we done, you know, and you look at Reggie's career, Reggie was phenomenal from day one. Um, he was great for a guy like myself, because mm-hmm. honestly, when you have to when you have to scale yourself on or, 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 or put yourself on a scale of saying what you want to look like or who you have to compare yourself to be to play at this level. To have a guy like Reggie Wayne, it was easy for me to live up to what I had to live up to to be able to play. Because mm-hmm. Reggie out the door, he was prototypical to us. You know, I, I have I've spoken about this many, you know, many of times to different podcasts and different, you know, uh, people I share stories with. Reggie was the prototype as a wide receiver, you know, in the collegiate level that I've ever seen. And it was like he was on my team. Mm-hmm. I, I felt like he, he was just that six one, six one, you know, six feet, six one. He had the size. He had the build. He, he caught everything. And. You know, I look back at a lot of receivers, I judge them, and I say, man, you know, what could I bring to the table that's going to allow me to be in the same breath as the Reggie Wayne? So I knew my game was different. You know, my game was, you know, a little more, you know, beat that guy all the time. And it wasn't about, you know, playing with him in the line of scrimmage. I'm just going to run past you. Uh, I didn't have to sit up there. And uh, one of the things that I worked on more than anything that Reggie allowed me or Reggie helped me with and he didn't help me because I asked him to help me. It's watching him not miss a pass. Mm. However that ball got to him, he caught it. So I, I used to judge myself like, man, I, shit, I might drop a hitch, you know, because I'm trying to, I'm trying to turn around. I'm trying to turn up field with that thing. And right. I remember CJ telling me like, Tanner, they ain't gonna call your name unless you catch the ball first. And then I just watched film and I'm sitting there like, man, that boy Reggie catch two yard catch, three yard. 
and it adds up. So <laughs> watching him, having him there, it made me grow as a player. It made me grow as a receiver. And then allowing myself just to be me. When I ball out of my hand, I'm looking for that band striker because I know what I'm going to do afterwards. You know what I'm saying? So to answer your question, I care less about who went first. Mm. I've always, at the time of being a, of being a Hurricane, when I finally got a chance to start alongside with him, you we can't be the same. Somebody has to do something different, you know? I always looked at Reggie for being Reggie, and I looked at myself for being me. Like, we was the great – we was like a, a, a perfect match. When you have a duo of receivers, you can't put two Odell Beckhams out there because somebody's going to feel cheated. You understand? Yeah. You got to have a Reggie Wayne in the Santana. You got to have a guy that's going to catch everything, that's going to move the chains – that's going to dice you up. That's going to beat you up. And then you got to have a guy that's, you know what? When you, when you caught What's slipping, up, you, know, <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's how I look at myself. I never compared myself as being better or less because I felt like together we meshed perfectly. You know, yeah. so when we was coming to the draft, my body of work kind of had built up to the point to where you look at it and you was like, I heard the, you know, the rumblings that Tanner, you know, my junior year, they told me like, look, if you get into this draft, you and P-Dub, you might mess up things for P-Dub. You know, that's what I was here in my junior year. So going into my senior year, it was no doubt that I was going to get drafted in the first round. I had no clue who was going first or second. I just felt like I was going to be drafted in the first round. So when it happened, you know, at the time, I didn't have even a, 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 a chance to let it, you know, soak in. Like, oh, man, I just got taken before Reg. It was just a great moment because I've always looked forward to having this moment. Yeah. And Santa, you were selected 16th and Reggie went 30th, right? Yeah, Reggie went 30th. Yeah, Santana was 16th. Yeah. I think and, and, you, want to, you, want, you want to add to that question. Um, leading up into the combine, I didn't go to the I didn't go to the uh senior bowl. So that let me know then and there that I didn't have to do much more. Now, I wasn't happy with Reggie having to go to the senior bowl because I felt like, damn, this is the guy who I was trying to, you know what I'm saying? Be like, but me and Reggie, you know, being the guys that we were, level-headed, you know, we ain't asking for none. We're going to go out there and take ours. Or uh, if you don't want to give it to us, we're going to take it. Mm -hmm. Reggie was always a guy that, to me, I felt like he was the wrong guy to try. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> to me, going putting him in the scene bowl was like a try. Like, you right. tried him. Like, you basically, right. you basically didn't give him enough respect for what he's done, right. you know? But then also, we also logically thinking, we understood. Reggie got hurt, hurt his knee at one point, and so now they want to see a little more. So yeah. that's how I looked at it, and that's how he looked at it. I never looked at myself as being better. I never looked at him being better. I just felt like, shit, you put us in the same room together, you got a, you got alpha A, alpha B. Right. Yeah. Alpha A, A, you know, one A, one B. Like, you know, it, it's, it's, it's like, you know, you pick your poison, what you like the most. You like oranges, you might, you might like oranges, you might like plums. You know what I mean? Whatever one you like as a fruit, we had them. You know what I mean? It was right. me and him, either or. So that's how I always looked at them. And to this day, like, I hear people talking and, and always want to compare. And I'm like, man, you can't compare us two. We was just two receivers that did, that wow people differently. And at the end of the day, you know, collectively, man, we put on the show. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Hey, Tana, do, has the perception of smaller receivers changed since you entered the league 20 years ago? Oh, no. No question. I mean, no question. I mean, this put it like this. This this go this right here will, will answer your question. When I was coming out in two thousand or one, mm -hmm. this was the narrative. This is what, what was told to my agent and what was told to me in my face. If you were six feet, if you was five eleven, you would be the first receiver taken. Wow, that what was told to me. And I sat there and like, and, and you gotta understand, we babies. 20 years old, 21 years old, we we don't understand. We just trying to make it, man. We don't mm -hmm. we don't been through the fire, man. We, we from South Florida. Whatever you think we've seen, we saw and more. And whatever you think we went through, we've done that and more. So to be where I'm at, the even the door that I, the way I got in, I'm not thinking about where on the scale. I'm just thinking about getting in that door because that's what I <laughs> dreamed of doing. Yeah, you right. asked me when I was five or six years old what I want to do, pro, play pro football. You know, so now to be here, to be able to say, hey, I'm going to, in a week or so, I'm about to be drafted. I care less about the number. And I care less about the round. I just know I was going. I know the body of the work that I laid, I left behind. 
has allowed me to see a see a, a, a nice payday where I can take care of my family and pursue something that I've always wanted to do. So to hear somebody say, look, man, whoo, we, whoo, we, man, this is phenomenal. But if you was such and such size, you would be first. How could you rob me from that because of my height? You understand? Right. So a little of that, knowing that when I got into the league, I think that always hung over me. And I've always that if you ask me and I can't say that's the reason why I played big. No, I can't because I, that was just me. It was in my DNA, like punch him in my face, you better punch a little harder. You know what I mean? So yeah. it was in my DNA. Like I just was born that way. Like I, you ain't going to stop me for Cause you say you're going to stop me. You better sh- prove it, you know, sure. or do it. And hey so- Tana, re- real quick, uh, before I forget, you talking about bigger receivers. Do you remember the receivers that dra- got drafted before you? Oh, no question. Yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> hey, Porter, hey, Porter hey, Robinson. Okay. Uh, Dave Terrell. What, okay. What college they went to? They, uh, everybody, Dave, Dave Terrell went to uh, Michigan. Michigan. He got drafted by who? Uh, he went to Chicago. Okay. Yep. He was the first Porter, one. Porter Robinson went to uh, South Carolina. Uh, it, no, it, North Carolina it, State. North Carolina there you State. go. Yep. And who drafted to, him? Seattle. Uh huh. And um, Rod Gardner went to the Redskins. Well, now that's that's called the uh, Washington football team. Yep. So, and what college you went to? Uh, the U. You already know what time it is. And but think about. <laughs> hold on. Let's get. Hold on. Now that we bring that up, and I don't know if we was gonna get to this or not. Ask me what I was told that I was going. What team I was going to the, of of draft week? Who what team you was going to? Draft draft week? Week? I talked to what, nobody what but Washington Press. Really? I was going to the Washington Redskins. At the 16th, I mean, at the 15th pick, everybody in their mama called me from Washington, like, are you ready to be in the, you know, back then it was called. Uh, wow. You know, so, I, so being that I'm the person that I am, I'm like, show me. I'm, I'm not from Missouri, but you still got to show me. <laughs> I never got my hopes up high. I Wait a minute. Myself, like, Look, man, until I get drafted, I don't want to talk about where I'm going, but whatever happens, you know, right. it's going to happen. So Washington, they're telling you they're going to draft you. But instead of drafting Santana Moss, they go draft Rob Gardner, another wide receiver. Yeah. So and now it, let me tell you why. Dan Snyder wanted me. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, Schadenheide wanted the taller receiver. And yep. they feel, they had a few. Look, this is crazy because it lingered around my whole Jet career. For four years, every, every player we get from the Redskins would come over and tell me the story. Like, man, you supposed to be in a skin. And I'm like, well, damn, that shit was true then because I was told that. Mm-hmm. Right. And so Dan Snyder came in there. This is what we want. And Sean Herman said, no, I want a tall receiver. And so he picked Gardner because of that. And that's why the Jets moved up and got me at 16 because they thought I'd be going at 15. Mm. Wow. Crazy story. And so Lockett, you know, the guy Lockett from Seattle, mm-hmm. yeah. his dad was in Washington. He came over to the Jets and said, bro, you won't believe what was going on over there. <laughs> wow. And I'm still like, what? He say, man, Dan Snyder wants you. And then to add to that, every year Dan Snyder tried to trade for me while I was a Jet. And so, and so the trade makes sense now. It yeah. makes a lot of sense. But guess what? The, the year that he didn't try, that's the year I got traded there. It's crazy. Because uh-huh. if you if you if you think about it, they traded uh Washington traded Lavernius Coles yep. for you. And you and Trouble Coles are not that, it's not a big difference in the measurables. You know what I mean? I think Trouble Cole may, may be an inch or so taller than you. Taller. But that was Dan Snyder just feeling some type of way because he didn't get a chance to draft you initially and yeah. he wanted to get his hands on you. So now, now it makes sense. You know what I mean? The underlying stories and draft nights, we hear it all the time. But to hear yeah. your story yeah. and hearing that, yeah, they wanted to get and- you, the owner wanted to go one way, the head coach wanted to go another way. And usually we hear the owner always win that battle. But in right. that scenario, the head coach won the battle. Eventually, owner came back and trumped Look, the head coach and made that move happen to trade. Right. I'm sitting in the office with Dan. And he said, man, do you, can you believe it? Every year, I, I, I sent out a trade for you. And in 2004, I watched you light up the playoffs. I don't know if you was a part of that. Um, that uh, no, Steal the team? You had just, you had just yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I wasn't there yet. Yeah. But they talk. They, 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 they still talk about that in Pittsburgh. I ran a punt back against <laughs> y'all in the second round playoffs. The mm-hmm. first round, I bombed uh, uh, Quint Jammer in, in uh, San Diego and had a touchdown. So 
the first round playoffs, I had a hundred some yards with a touchdown receiving. The second round playoffs, I run a punt back, the first first punt return in Jet history in the playoffs. So Dan say, man, when I saw you do that in the playoffs, I'm like, man, I'm not even going after this guy no more. They, 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 it's no question they're not going to get rid of this guy. Mm-hmm. And he said, then I get paper some out. It's going to be a, 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 a equal swap, Lavernius for Santana. And you're like, this is crazy. You know, so <laughs> I'm sitting there like, man, look, I don't know how it happened. I know Porter's had a little hand in it and Drew Rosenhaus, but at the end of the day, what was meant to be happened. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's, I, I mean, I really looked at that as like, look, um, I enjoyed my time in New York. Uh, it was bumpy. It was a bumpy road from the start. But I was, I'm grateful because I experienced so much as a kid and I was able to take that and, and, and use that as growth. And I was able to take that with me to Washington. And I was, a, to me, you know, regardless of the circumstances of what we went through as a team and, you know, the up and downs and not going to the playoffs, I still grew into, a, you know, a, a, a pretty good talent. You know what I mean? And, and I was able to display that, you know, year in and year out. Yeah, man. Fast forward and over to, you know, two. 2000- Five season where you balled out, had 84 catches, nine touchdowns, 1,400 yards, second in the, in the NFL. Behind our former guest, all thing covered, Steve Smith, what was unleashed for you that year? Like, what, what, yeah, you what, went, you what, went what crazy. was the, the turning point for you coming into that 2005 season? Opportunity. Yeah. Here's the opportunity. I mean, if you think about it, so let's go back. So, first of all, I never get no my, my, my true respect for. My first year really playing in the pros, the first full season was 2002. I was drafted in mm-hmm. 2000 when I got hurt initially out the door in training camp. I didn't play that season until like the last two or three games. So, you know, I'm, I'm, you can just throw anybody out there by that time. That game is well ahead of me. That season is well ahead of me. My first year playing was 2002. I was an all pro as a punt returner, first team all pro. No one ever puts that. Go and look it up. Google it. My first season, I was I, I led the league in punt returns, and I didn't get a chance to go to the Pro Bowl because back then it was almost that. Show me one year, then the next year you'll go. Yeah, so right. they gave me an alternate as a Pro Bowler, and I was a first team. I was first team All Pro as a punt return. So you know that alone, and then the next year I hit him in the face because now I have a thousand yards. You know, in less than sixteen weeks, I didn't start until week five. And I get a thousand yard season, my first thousand yard season, my first year starting. And mm-hmm. I didn't start the whole season. So that year, if you if you look at 2003 and look at 2005, it was the same thing that happened. I had the opportunity. It was the attempts. You know, I had two veteran quarterbacks, 2003 with the Jets. Benny Testaverde had to get thrown into that because Chad Pennington got hurt. Mm-hmm. Benny saw every time I came in when I was, you know, because I was coming in a lot, but I wasn't starting. He knew on film, Tanner, you keep showing up. That was my thing. Like, I, you know, I learned that at an early age, at a young age, that, man, just show up. They're going to see you. So I would show up every time. Even when I'm backside out the read, I'm like, man, I'm going to show up. I'm going to beat this dude. I don't mm-hmm. care if I'm backside. So I would do that. And Benny started saying, look, I would come out of the huddle and Benny say, hey, Trey, I might come back to you, man. I see you. You was open last week. Come on. And he did it against Miami. I, I beat Sam Madison on a, a, a bum, I remember. I scored that touchdown, and the rest was history. Benny came to me every play. So you fast forward, that season now, I had 1,100-some yards. I had 10 touchdowns. I broke a record for the most touchdowns in the consecutive game, you know, for the Jets. And I'm a Pro Bowl alternate again. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's crazy how this stuff is. So now, 04, they like, man, this man finna get paid. Let's blackball him. They don't want to throw me the ball. Right. But then now we're finna get ready to go to playoffs. We gotta throw 83 the ball. So all <laughs> that stuff happened. You know, I can tell you that story another time. But to get to 2005, we had Patrick Ramsey as the quarterback. And the first game of the season, he goes down. Mark Monell goes in there within the sixth play of the game, seventh play of the game, I don't know. And he just had that same kind of, you know, vibe as Vinny Testaverde. He's watching mm-hmm. everything. He will, I will come back to the huddle and he'd be like, eight, nine. How was it? You was open? And you know, as a receiver, I'm going to say, yeah, anyway. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm like yeah, yeah, I'm open. And Mark, he got a me and Mark didn't have a practice. We didn't have a practice rep, all training camp. And got to think about it. I'm a first, this is my first time on, you know, with the team. So I went with Ramsey every play, every yeah. rep. And Mark get thrown out there, but just his knowledge of the game and just his respect for guys like myself. 
he put the ball in there at me and then I went out there being the guy who I was from day one, just hungry. And that's why the, you know, the stats was up there because every week now they, they drawing plays in the dirt for me. Cause they like, look, <laughs> do it. we throwing it at you. So that's what's the difference from my whole career. If you go back to 05, it was more, more opportunity. And we didn't really necessarily put a playbook up and say, we're going to run, we're going to run. You know how we have the little, you no, know, we're going to do this, this and that and that, man, they got to the point in the passing game in 05, it was just like, look, put this and throw the 89. We, we right. ran this, throw the 89. And that's how yeah. I was able to go out there and accumulate so many yards and have the season that I had. Wow. They should have had that in the recipe every year after every, 2005. Look, look I promise you, no lie. In 06, we brought in Randall L. and Brandon Lloyd. Mm -hmm. And I looked at the team like, what the hell are we doing? Yeah. And we brought in... um. Oh, man, I just forgot his name. Oh, Al Saunders. He was with Kansas City as a receiver coach or the quarterback coach. They brought him in to run the Kansas City offense, and he was going to be the offensive coordinator. Mm -hmm. Al Saunders told me in, to, in my face, after looking at what I did in 05, he's like, you're going to have 2,000 yards. But then you sit Mark Brunel down and put Jason Campbell in there. Yeah. <laughs> so at the end of the season, Al Saunders apologized to me. And I'm like, man, you know, I ain't tripping on them yards because yeah, y'all burnt me, but I'm not tripping because as a I'm always been a team guy. You know what yeah. I mean? Whatever works for us to win, that's all I'm about. You know, now I do, do I want to get me, yeah, I want to get my fair share, but whatever works, if it's not working, then we got to go, you know, and make sure that we put in the best effort to win. And we wasn't winning. So at the mm -hmm. end of the day, you didn't let me down, you let the team down that we didn't win. And I didn't feel like at the time Jason was a young pup. He couldn't run that. He wasn't stuff. quite ready yet. Yeah, he wasn't ready. And so yeah. I felt like more than anything, that was a more of a letdown. But even going into that season, I was scratching my head because I'm like, you brought in two receivers after I have the best receiver season that you guys had in a long time. You brought in two more guys like that was going to take pressure off me. No, that was going to take away the ball from me. You know what I'm saying? So, no question. Yeah, that's, that's how I looked at that. Hmm. And, and speaking of your Washington career, uh, MJ is famous for the flu game. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people don't know Santana Moss had a Hennessy game in 2007 <laughs> against the Dallas Cowboys. Tana Man is dealing with an injury. And if you know anything about the National Football League, when you're dealing with an injury, they usually emphasize a toward or a shot. We yep. call it a tee shot. They kind of numb the pain. You take it right before the ball game. Uh, it, it numbs your body for whatever ailment you're dealing with. You don't feel it until after the game, right? But you decline to take the tee shot. And you decided to take a few shots of Hennessy. Hennessy Fill us in on that story. <laughs> <laughs> Against the Cowboys. And by the way, before he gets into the story, went crazy. viewers, nine <laughs> catches. Tanner had straight off Hennessy. Straight off Hennessy. <laughs> nine catches, 121 yards, and a touchdown. Yeah. Straight off Hennessy. Tell Hennessy us about that story. Shot. Hell Hennessy, Hennessy shot. Hey, Hennessy. hey, Pat P, that was the Hennessy game. We're going to go ahead and give that the Hennessy <laughs> game for Tanner. Well... It's crazy because we <laughs> honestly it's it's funny because I was doing it way before then. Mm -hmm. Uh I think it was it meant more because of that game. I wasn't expecting to play. And I told what my, injury you you were dealing with? I had a heel injury. So okay. let me tell you how it happened. I go to New York first time back in New York playing the Jets. Now I, I go to back in New York every year because we play the Giants in New York. You yep. know, that's my division. It's my first time playing my old team back in New York. And good friend of mine, you know Bo, Bo yep. DB, Bo a cornerback. So mm -hmm. me and Bo talk football all day. That's like my boy, you know. He know who I'm playing before I know him. Bo knows Tanner don't watch the guys. I don't care about who I'm facing. I don't like to see what good they do or bad because I want to see that that day. You know what I mean? Because I know it's going to be a difference. Think about it, Pat P, and yourself, B-Man. Mm -hmm. You know it's certain guys when you get – Face them, you're going to change this a little bit about your game off the respect alone. Yeah, right. I know that as a receiver. It's certain DBs off of what I do to the other deep or the, you know, someone else, I'm going to change according to who I know him as. So I never cared about watching guys because I know it's going to be a different, you know, um, um, thing or, or scheme when it comes to us, you know, meeting each other face to face. So Bo warns me. He said, hey, man, the Jets have, show me, by far the best corner that came out the draft. He's talking about Revis. He said, yeah. man, this dude here is lights out. I ain't know nothing diddly about Revis. 
So I'm like, well, yeah, you know, all right, I hear you. So we go out and play. I had a pretty productive game. Like we didn't really, I could have won the game. I hit, I beat somebody. I'm not even sure if it was Revis or, or, or Revis. I beat somebody on a, um, a out and up. And Jason threw that thing in the stands. That's how. <laughs> <laughs> that was the story of my life, man. At times with Jay. I love him. That's my boy. But his arm was too big for him. He didn't know what to do with that thing. <laughs> that could have won the game. But we ended up winning anyway. But throughout the course of the game, I caught like a slant or something on Revis. And um, he fell on the back of my leg. And I was trying to break the tackle. You know how I am. I'm trying to break the tackle. And he fell directly on the back of my heel. And that thing was had a heartbeat. And I tried to just, you know, <laughs> I, took I took something and it got out of pause. <laughs> <laughs> but after the game, <laughs> things swelled up on me, man. You know, it swelled up on me. And so from, from there, I had to miss a week. I missed, I missed one or two weeks. And leading up to, to Dallas week, I was finna miss. Yeah. And Dan came down like, he came in the training room, and I'm like, this is odd. Dan Snyder in the training room. And you got to think, it's still new to me. It's only my third season with these guys. So I'm like, I ain't never see Snyder down here in the training room. Right. like, man, right? So I'm like, you know, uh, this is we, this is um, we in the third day of practice, and I ain't out there yet. Mm, <laughs> I doubt it, you know? Yeah. Right. Um, and so what we got to do? I said, what you mean what we got to do? I said, man, <laughs> I can't even put a shoe on. Like, I'm walking around with that boot. Like I can't even put my 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 heel can't even take nothing. It's too sensitive. And so, like I, you know, and I and I tell the story because Dan had nothing to do with anything that I did. Yeah. He just wanted me out there. And so I was like, look, I said, man, I know what I can do. Cause I now I realize just by seeing him down there and knowing who we facing, I'm like, oh man, it's Dallas. This is why he coming down here. I said, man, well. And I and I was against not practicing and playing. Yeah, that, a lot of other players cool with that. Not mm-hmm. me. I, I, preparation was everything for me. Right. No question. No Look, question. you can be my quarterback for sixteen weeks. If I miss one week of practice with you, I I need to know how that the velocity of that ball is coming. I need to know what you're seeing in certain plays. You know that's why we rep this stuff. So yep. I was always big on being out there. And by me knowing that I wasn't out there, I was like, okay, I'm counting myself out. So, but seeing him now, I just got a different breath of motivation. Like, oh man, you know, the owner come down here checking for you. Can't let him down. That's how I'm built. That's how I'm wired. So I say, if I try Viking in the mar in practice, and if it takes some of the pain away, I know what else to do on Sunday. Yeah. That Viking has got to give me the proof that, hey, work. So if this don't work, then I can rest assured that that Viking ain't gonna work. Never mm-hmm. took a bike. I took a biking only once, and that was in New York. And I share that story another day. But that's how I realized the biking in could work. Yeah. So I took the biking in on Thursday practice. And you know, Thursday practice is where we putting the most, you know, uh, stuff in, especially red zone and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And I mean, third down. And so I took it and I put the shoe on halfway. I taped it up real good. I made it through practice, but I looked stank. I was. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot of doubt. I had a lot of doubt in my mind, but I said to myself, I didn't try to hint. I know that's what I do anyway. Yeah. So, you know, lean to the game, I drank. I, that's it's just something that I, I, <laughs> I, you know, I did it in college and track. And that was, that's how I got to this, you know. So, you were, you were taking a shot back in, in your college days. I didn't do track. it in football in college. I did it but in track. track in college. Yeah. So, yeah. So, taking a shot was late. normal for you. Taking a shot I was normal. I discovered it late in college, though. It was okay. late when I discovered it. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I wasn't able to, to do it in football because, you know, it was after my last season of track, mm-hmm. I was going to the pros. Yep. And I knew it worked in college and track. So I was like, man, I've done this before and I've done it before in the league. So let me just try this, you know? So we get into that game. I know I'm going to take the biking in. So I told myself before I take the biking in, let me do my ritual. Yeah. You know, I lay my stuff out. I have my little Gatorade bottle that I don't put my hand in already. It's always taped up. So you know, down the road, most of the coaches that coach me, they'll look at my locker and know what's going on because they don't heard the story or nothing. Yeah, the Gatorade the bottle time, with tape around it was Hennessy. Bingo. At the time, no yeah. one knew why that why that Gatorade bottle had tape on it. They always yeah. thought he just had something he'd do with his Gatorade <laughs> bottle. So at the time, no one knew. But when guys saw me in the locker room, put my stuff on, have my music bumping, they just came in knowing that, oh, we got 8-9 to play. He going to play, and we know this is Dallas. Yeah. And so – Right. I'm, I'm ready. I go out there. I go through warm-ups. I don't have a bike in it at all. And I'm 
gliding through warm up like uh, put my foot in the ground. <laughs> They don't messed up. They don't. <laughs> so now I go in the locker room. I'm like, give me the Viking. Cause I know what the Viking is gonna do. Yeah. But I didn't know what this hand was gonna do. The hand numbed everything up. <laughs> <laughs> but so I, I put the Viking in and the hand, that's the, you know, trust me. How much hand did you drink? Ten, how, how much hand did you drink? No, it's 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 always a reasonable amount. Now don't get okay, me wrong. Reason. So I, I pour a little bit in there and then I dilute it with Gatorade. You know what okay, I'm saying? Like I, that was my thing about it. Like I would get the Gatorade, I pour the Gatorade in the cup, I fill the hand up, you know, to the bottom, and yeah. then I dilute that stuff with Gatorade. So, you know, it's getting to me quick, but you know what the Gatorade do? It, it, it gets in that, that bloodstream real quick. Yeah. So it's hitting me faster than it would be if I wasn't chasing it at all, you know? But um, I didn't know the Viking in the hand was going to work that way. And I won't <laughs> I advise nobody or anybody who listens to this, don't do that. Don't, don't, don't do that. And take, you know, or take medication. Because to be honest with you, I heard things in that stadium I shouldn't have heard. Like I was, <laughs> I could hear a pin drop in the nose. <laughs> like I was literally sitting on the sideline at times. And it was like, I heard conversations. <laughs> I was what? Just, man, it was just like, damn. Hey, Tanner. It was like it was like you were playing during a pandemic with an empty stadium. You were hearing everything in there. Everything. <laughs> I was questioning myself, man, so much. Like, man, what's that small for doing this, man? <laughs> but I wanted to play so bad, honestly, man. I wanted to play so bad. I mean, you know, amongst all the stuff that we was going through at that time, I was yeah. just trying to play, be there for my team. I mean, we could sit here and laugh and joke about it. I did it. And I didn't do it with just to be saying I'm doing this because it's just something I want to do. Like I did Team it, I God. Like it, it. It gave me my comfort that I needed. It, it eased the little stuff that I was going through that right. I had to get over so I can go out and do what I do. And I went out there and put on the show. I went out there and played well. We just, I don't think we came, we was uh, inches away from winning again. You know, we didn't win. Freaking first down and all that. <laughs> that, that, that. Hey, Pat P, that's his first down. Anytime we be you in the boo ray table and Tana boo somebody, I say, you do that the first down signal. <laughs> 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 hey, he used to kill Dallas with that. Anytime man, Tanner play against Dallas in, in, in a Washington uniform, yeah, yeah. Hey, he gonna get that first down. I believe that game, To did it. To when oh, I yeah. did it at our sideline, and I ran a reverse and did it back at their sideline. Like, would you ever do my damn? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, Tanner, we got. I got. I got one more for you before we get to our superlatives. Uh, uh, in that same season. I know you lost someone very, very dear to you to, as, as the Washington family and the University of Miami family dealing with the tragedy of uh, Sean Taylor. Um, what did he mean to those programs? He meant a lot, man. I mean, Sean, it's hard to talk about him and just because, and that, it's great to just keep his, his legacy going. Like, I love the fact that we talk about him so much because I feel like He's like one of those players, you'd be like, what if? You know what I mean? Like, we understand a lot of things in our game, but if you really saw who he was becoming, what if? Mm -hmm. Like, what he, what could he have been? You know what I mean? And I really think the demise of our team was because of Sean gone. He rolled, he roamed that secondary. He put fear in everybody game plan, man. You know, if Sean oh, Taylor's back there, people coming to the game a little different. They gonna, they gonna, they gonna scout a little different. They gonna, the game. Yeah, I mean, it was just a lot we lost, man. But to be to, to be truthful, you know, I, I didn't share that time with him in Miami, but I can tell you that everybody who was there in Miami, who knew of his play there, they felt just like we felt in Washington. You know, I was devastated. I think in a lot of the ways that I live today is because of having to experience that. Like, yeah. I really, man, it, I can't sit here and just say, put a pinpoint at something that I was doing at the time. But I was frightened to do anything that I wasn't doing right after Sean, you know, mm -hmm. um, left us. And one, because I was able to sit there and share a lot of, you know, uh, intimate moments with him outside of us being on the field. We should have conversated or converse, I shall say, with each other a lot. Just sitting there in the training room. We was both dealing with injuries that year. And I recall an inj I recall that same week that that those guys broke into the house the first time we talked about it. Mm. I sat there and the advice I gave him was like, Sean, let that be. But we know Sean. He was like, nah, man, they, uh, you know, he felt violated. He felt like mm. 
if I was there, it was something else would have been happening, you know, would have happened. And I'm like, yeah, but yeah, I didn't know that that was the second time. I didn't know it was the first yeah. time. They came I didn't know back. that. Yeah. They came back. They came that's back. Same people came to go home. Came that's what back. Came to go home when he wasn't supposed to go home or something like that. They right? came back. And all the only reason why they came back is because they knew he was in the season and they came for a safe. His wow. I don't know the whole story. I'm yeah, give you what I know, but all I know is that. They was there for a party that his sister or someone of Sean, you know, Sean family threw a party and she showed him around and she showed him something that they weren't supposed to see. So they came back for that safe. Wow. Sean, first time they came, the party was over. They came by themselves. They didn't get it. The second time, Sean ended up being there. And, wow. how, you know, the situation happened. But just to get back to your question, he meant a lot, man. And um, I think, you know, I tried my best for the for the remainder of the time I played as a pro to play to allow Sean to play through me. I know this might sound crazy, and you know, people looking at man, tell me what you're talking about. Look, that was something that I put on the table. I like, look, you know, when I prayed every you know game going into that end zone, I got on that knee. I wanted Sean to play with me because he, you know, just knowing that he was his presence was always felt. Like I felt like walking in the locker room, you gotta think, me, Sean, and Porters, our locker was next to each other. Me, Sean, and Porters. Like we was, we was boys, we was we would talk that weekend that, that he left us. Me, Sean, and Porters was the last person in the locker room. Sean wasn't coming. We knew he was going to Miami. We was going to Tampa. Yeah. He told us to go out there and have a good game. I see y'all when y'all get back. You know, so it it, it was devastating, man. But you know, you can always find a silver lining in, in things, whether it's good or bad. And I felt like it woke a lot of us up, honestly. Yeah. I, I really, truly believe that my game changed a lot. The things that I took for granted changed a lot. And I had more of a purpose, just knowing that life is short. And I always knew it was short, but it really showed me that. Just this guy had a promise of career ahead of himself. And beyond football, I saw changes in this man as a man. <clears throat> Sean wasn't going out with us. We had a we had a weekend in D.C. called the Three Kings. Yeah. Portis. So let me tell you how we came about it. Portis, myself, and Sean, we all from Miami. And I didn't even know the reason why we made this thing. But Portis <laughs> realized that his birthday is the 1st of August. Sean's birthday is the 1st of April. And my birthday is the 1st of June. So we all like, Shh. and Portis made this thing, Three Kings. We all going to have a weekend where and everybody and mama would come worldwide and yeah. they would come and, and party and celebrate with us sean mm. would never show up and if he did show up he showed up on the last night mm -hmm. and he barely would hang he would show his face and but he was changing as a man he stopped hanging he stopped doing all that crazy stuff that we heard early in his career because he had a new purpose he had a daughter he mm -hmm. you know baby jackie and he wanted to be a better father and the things that people talked about about sean in the paper you know it was it was it, it, it was very hurtful to hear some of those people talk about him the same way when he passed. Cause if I recall was one reporter said, well, the person that we know, you know, for what happened to him, it was almost something that we will assume that would happen. Wow. Like, yeah. you know this man, how could you put that on somebody, you know? And I, it, it took me by surprise, but then again, I wasn't surprised because I understand that a lot of people that cover us don't really know us. You know, they cover the game. They see how, no violent. question. They see the violence that he played with, the recklessness. They see, you know, you know, a couple of instances that he had had where he spit in somebody's face and, uh, you know, the uh, case that he caught for someone stealing his ATVs. All that stuff basically proves who you are, I guess. You know what I mean? In a world that we give people a thousand of chances, you know what I mean? So we're going to just judge you because of what we saw or what we heard. Yeah. And uh, I think he left here, you know, and gave a lot of people that right to give him uh, a bad rep, but guys like myself, guys like Portis, guys who really knew him and played with him and the coaches that coached him. I'm glad that we were able, we we are able to keep his legacy on and talk, have these talks that we having today about. It. Well said, well said, man. Sean Taylor was a, listen, I was a fan and an enemy at the same time. Cause anytime <laughs> we played Miami, you know, Florida State, Miami, we used to always go into the week, man. Don't help this man get drafted higher than where he should go. Oh, man. That's always, always <laughs> said. Oh, man. That, and this man used to always pick six, 
knock someone out, oh, block cool. a punt. Oh, yeah. And like, <laughs> oh, man. And so, but heck of a football player, like you said, the, the what if, if yeah. that tragedy never happened, where where is he when you talk about the elites of the elites, not mm-hmm. just at his position, but in totality of all positional players in National Football League? Well, we're gonna see if we're gonna have him on the on the uh I ain't gonna give him no oh, 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 yeah, hold on, hold on, Pat. No, hold on, no, no, yeah, we, Wait, we you, you can't give him a, you can't give him a hint. You can't give him a hint. <laughs> we go we gonna transition to the superlative part of our show. And Pat P already had a question ready for you. So we out the gate, it's the first third down. We're gonna press you, we're gonna get in your chest. Pat P say gonna get in your chest with this question. Pat, so Pat, you run with Miami, the first one. Miami Hurricanes, Mount Rushmore. Four people. Yeah, Miami, Miami Hurricanes, Mount Rushmore. You heard the question, Tanner. Oh, rapid fire, Ooh. rapid fire. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, you got you got to give us four. I know it's a lot of greats in there, a lot of Hall of Famers. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> but you got four. You got four. <laughs> Michael Irvin. Okay. Quarterback position, I would say. Um, Gino Toretta. Okay. Old school. <laughs> that ain't tough. Fat P, man. He having problems getting off that jam right now. <laughs> he having problems yeah. getting off that jam. I'm fighting Pat P right now with this one. <laughs> uh, I said Mike Irvin already, right? Yeah. Yep. Irvin, Gino. Gino. Two more. Damn. Tough, and then guess what? It's, it's not gonna be everybody else's around, you know, Mount Rushmore. I'm mm-hmm. gonna put Edwin James in that. Okay, okay. he's more EJ. than new. EJ. New. And it's your Rush, uh, Mount yeah. Rushmore, so who cares what anybody else thinks? <laughs> I'm gonna just say Ed Reed, man. Ed okay. Reed, Gino, Irvin, Edwin James, Ed Reed. Ed Reed. That's Santana Mount Rushmore for Hurricanes. Ain't bad. His list, yeah, his, his list. list. I mean, you can Next throw question for guys you. on the list, but them, those are guys that I feel like amongst the guys, because you got to think, I played with Ed and EJ. Mm-hmm. Ed was very um, inspiring to what we all became. Edrin really set the tone. No you know, that 2000 class, if you think about it, we didn't know it was, we was able to do what we was able to do unless Edrin was there to show us. He showed us a lot in college, and then he took it to the league and showed us a lot in the league. EJ would come back and tell us, I'm going to show y'all what I'm going to do this year, and I'm going to show y'all how to do it. That's how he talked to us. And <laughs> he would never, bro, it was not a doubt that he wasn't going to go out and do something and bring it back to us and tell us how he done it. So that's why I give EJ that. And just for the, how he was able to scale his career off of just being a backup and then thrown in the fire and saying, I'm gone. You know what I'm saying? He ain't look mm-hmm. back. And then when you think about Michael Irvin. The playmaker. You no. Know, I have, you know, I beat his record for the most, you know, career, you know, yards. But when it comes to what Mike, Michael Irvin meant to University of Miami now and his team then, you know, I give myself the credit that I feel like I'm due. So I, but it was way more guys than me, you know what I mean, there that, that was able to play at a high level. So I can't sit here and feel like I was just a UM guy when I played. No, I had a cast of guys that, we all played our role, you know, the right way. When I when I sat back and watched those Florida teams, like I talked about, Florida State, Florida's, and Miami, when you talked about the Miami wide receivers, although they had Kevin Williams and all those other guys and Lamar Thomas behind those guys, Michael Irvin was everything in that. And yeah. still to this day, man, he's a spokesperson for, for the Hurricanes. So that's why he's sitting on the top of the throne. And the reason why I spoke about Geno, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think he's Heisman Trophy, right? Winner? Yeah, he is. Yeah. Heisman Trophy winner. And to me, I think that's that 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 alone and mm-hmm. what he did and you know those championship, you know, uh seasons. Mm-hmm. If I'm not mistaken, Gino last year they lost the championship to Bama. Did it? Did they lose lose in the Bama? sugar bowl? I, I we gotta do we gotta sugar we gotta, we gotta fact Bama. check that we gotta fact check that. Fact check I think, they did. I think he sugar lost, bowl. but I think he was one of those quarterbacks that even though Vinny Testaverde was there and I thought highly of Benny, you know, Gino was the guy when I was a young kid. And yeah. Reed, he came in with me. Reed could have easily played our first year, our freshman year when me and Reggie was thrust to play as freshman. Reed hurt his ankle and he that set him back. 
But when Reed got in that thing, man, it, you, man he controlled he controlled what the defense do, did. Yeah. Tell you a quick story about Reed, man, that stands out the most. In Penn State game, Mike Rump got beat by Chaffee Fields to, to lose that game on a bomb. Man, Reed watched film so well that he knew that if he saw, saw the coverage or whatever that they do, that they was doing at the time, that he can jump the crossing route. So Reed checked off and told them boys to bump. Hey, I see it. I see the formation. <laughs> Lo and behold, they ran what Reed thought they was going to run. Yeah. But that quarterback saw Choppy Field with Rump, and it was neck to neck. That was a quarterback just saying, I'm going to give my guy a chance. Yeah. And they Even bumped. he's leaving. Bingo. <laughs> So the coaches, they ripped a new one in Reed. I remember it like it was yesterday. And they set, they bench Reed the next game. Reed got in the next game and picked the first ball off, took it to the house. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and it was just that was a that was that's who Ed Reed was. Like, man, I I called what I saw. Yeah. At the end of the day, as a player, we have to own up to what we our responsibilities and make the play. Mike Rump didn't make the play. Chaffee Fields did. And don't blame Reed. You know what I'm saying? So, and we lost that game, and it was a close game. I, I was actually at that game, game too. The touchdown, we lost the game to them. So, that's why Reed stands there. And then, you know, so those are my guys. Those are the four guys I put on top. I was at that Penn State game, too. I, my high school football really? team. We, yeah, we, I was that's there. Yeah. yeah. Chaffee Fields. Uh, shoot, uh, LeVar Arrington was on that Penn State team, too. Yeah. Right? LeVar yep. Arrington mm -hmm. was out there. Look, I ran a couple of plays in the slot, and LeVar had to Come out, you know, he outside linebacker. He tell the story all the time. He like, man, ten out. I, I had to line up on you a couple of times. You went around me a couple of times. I'm like, man, I don't want no pars of number six. <laughs> 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 and I would laugh and I say, Levar, I ain't want no pause of you because you was a grown man out there, man. You no was no lineman and stuff making yeah. plays. So, <laughs> with that number eleven <laughs> on. Yeah. Last question for you, and that's the positive part of this show. Most underappreciated wide receiver in the National Football League. You're looking at him. There it is. You're looking at him. And uh, look, and uh, let's be real. You know me. And and be, Mac, you know me for a while. I don't want nothing than what did I deserve. You know, then I don't want more than I deserve. Put it like that. All I want is what I deserve. But the reason why I say that is because people see, like I said, they're they, they enamored by stats. And the stats doesn't always tell the story. It tells part of it because you have to mm -hmm. go out there and do it. Yep. Yeah. But you have to understand, too. And the reason why I'm going to bring this argument up, and I'm like I said before, I care less. When I was a hurricane, me and Reggie was fighting for 700 yards a, a year. That's all mm -hmm. we was getting. I had one year when I had 899. And guess why? Reggie hurt his knee the last couple of games of the season, so it was on my show. But more every year, we knew he was going to get by 700 yards. Yep. And guess what he was considered? two of the better wide receivers in, in collegiate football. So why did those 700 yard receivers didn't get no flack for catching a thousand yards then? But then we get into the lead and just because you didn't have a thousand yards, you're not considered top of your, 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 you know, your class or your core. I get it. Trust me. I fought hard every year for those thousand yards. That's all I wanted. Yeah. But if the system doesn't allow you to flourish that way, all you can be is all you can be. And I felt like with little that I got, I always, you know, did more. And so that's all I, I want credit for. Cool. Man, look, I'm not nobody because I know how hard it is to play this game that we love mm -hmm. and how hard is it is to be elite at, at our individual positions. A lot of guys, man, I, I look at and I'll be like, Whew. but then there's a lot of guys I look at him like, bro, if I had a piece of what you had, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, Nah, you know, that's that's just that's just being real. So um as a receiver, all we can do is what they allow us to do. Like I need the guys up front to block for my quarterback. I need my quarterback to be in sync with me. When you got 15 of them in 14 years, how could you ever, you know, find that comfort or find that chemistry and have those kind of you know seasons, you know, to put together? So I feel like I worked hard, man. I I I I look forward for 800 yard seasons. Mm -hmm. no, no book. I that was my line. Look, man, when all said and done, I got to get 800. Yeah, because I knew that it wasn't going to be peaches and cream for me. 
And you got to mm-hmm. think, I'm already small in stature. So I'm like, I got, I got so many odds against me right now. Yeah. I just got to get enough to be able to say I could be considered among the pack, amongst yeah. the pack. And that's what I did. I fought hard for that because I knew that my team wasn't going to always. And then you got to you got to also put into uh, context that some of these offenses now are wide open. I played yeah. in a run oriented offense all my career. Yeah, as college and pros. Curtis Martin leading the league almost every year. Yeah. Then as a you know a skin now we we call them you know watch the football team. You had Portis. Mm-hmm. You had Alfred Morris. Yeah. You had so many other guys that was back there that we we fed that ball to. So the one time that I got amongst the offense that we we really spread the football out was when the Shanahan's got there. And by that time, I had one season with him when I had a thousand yards where I was a starter. And the next year, I was in the slot. And, yeah. I, and we was all sharing the ball and getting 600 yards a piece. Yeah. So, you know, that's why I look at it and I say, you know, I'm not sitting here saying give Tanner this praise. No, nah, I don't I don't deserve nothing that not deserving. But for what I've done, no, nah, speak my name amongst the others, because I feel like in that 2000 era from 2001, let's say up to 2010, regardless of what went on, when you came to Washington, who you had to check for? Moss, hey, I know that hey, you used to run that out route, man, like you were stepping on cockroaches, man. You run the out route so hard and precise, but you're like, boy, you better get up out that pedal. Hey, don't be hey, don't be sitting too deep in that pedal. <laughs> and may I say this, though? May I say this? Although the people that are stat watchers and they just don't watch the game, they don't know football. Yeah. Guys that are always giving me my flowers, the, the, the you know, the guys who I face was the DBs. Those guys I face, those guys I really had to sit up there in front of. When I see them, they always, boy, look at here, you know. I remember sitting there, you know, we play bull a lot, and, and I still do now when I pop up in town. I go to Trail House and Trail Road. Mm-hmm. And Trail mm-hmm. State Tanner, man, it got to a point where you was a slot guy. We knew you coming in on third down. And our coaches used to tell us, look, when they not come in the game, just know he could beat you. He get the ball. Just know he getting the ball. <laughs> and Trail said, I'll be darn, man. You, you whoever on you that you beating them. And we said, yeah, we just, it 36. We just <laughs> sat here and went over this. And I told Trey, I said, man, Trey, I never knew. I never knew that that you know, and you know, as players leading up to the game, you're gonna always have your scout report, who right. the guys were. And I, you know, it was great to hear a story from a guy who I faced twice a year and and, yeah. and also was a hurricane, and he was a guy that always me and him both wore six at the U. He said, Ten, I ain't gonna lie, man. We knew third down, yeah. when you came in the game, we got a check for you, and you found a way to still get open. So that right there is just a, more than enough that I can receive. But when I hear people talk about others, I sit back and I don't say much because I'm not tripping on it. I just feel like, man, don't watch the stats, go watch the games, go yeah. see what I was doing with the little that I was getting, you know. No doubt. Well said. Well said, man. Well, Santana, man, thank you for joining us here on All Things Covered, man. A great conversation with Santana Moss, the cowboy killer, to say the least. It, it, it might not be too late to get a little Hennessy <laughs> trademark, too, uh, Tanner. It might not be too too late for that. You know what I mean? Go ahead and get trademark. that Hennessy trademark. Yeah, get something. Get a little sponsorship going on, baby. Right. Hitting that Gatorade got, got like you 121. Every, look, for you to tell me that, it's three things that people have told me to trademark throughout my you know, career playing football. Yeah. Big time players step up in big games. Yep. If that was against your boy, you know, you, Florida State, you weren't there yet, I don't think. And the Cowboy Killer, I've heard trademark Cowboy Killer. Man, look, that was given to me. I don't care less about it. But now you're telling me the Hennessy trademark. Man, I can't think. <laughs> I think Man, it, I hey, it's worth look. a shot. It's hey, worth a I, shot. Look. Hey. Go ahead, get that thing trademark and bring some bring some of your gifts to the boo ray table. So I can boo you. I ain't gonna let you in neither time. You know, I let you in every now and then. I'm gonna boo you, get that trademark. Hey, we, we got the same kind of method of how we do things. We gonna allow the guys to get in, but when it's time to kill you, we got that man. Look here, I can't help you, your kid, your mama, nobody. nobody. I gotta give it to you. So gotta get them. <laughs> hey, no doubt, no doubt. But man, appreciate you joining us here. All things covered, man. Santana Malls, man. Much love, former man. New York Jets. Former Washington football team player, of course, former Hurricane as well. Pat, keep doing your thing, man. We watching you, boy. Keep it up. Appreciate it. Appreciate it, Santana. All love, man.